All righty, time now to turn to Dr. Safety and Moose. Everyone in the audience knows him as the author of this instant classic, The Bitcoin Standard. Personally, this copy's autographed to me from the author, and it says right here, uh, mentions that Bitcoin about a better world. A better world is possible. Exactly right, Safety and Moose. Now, the book is also, uh, we got the companion piece out, the, the Fiat Standard which you can find at safetyn.com. The book is not only quite timely for 2021, as we see the U.S. dollar celebrate its 50th anniversary, but I think quite interesting for our audience as Orange Pill likes to look at history, art, and culture and society to understand where we are today, Stacey. Right, Safetyn, you know, it's it, your book is being published, The Fiat Standard, on your site, safetyn.com, kind of as a course. So I feel like we're going to be graded for our questions here, whether or not we read the book and understand it. But what I have to ask for you is, so I'm going to summarize the book from what I understand and kind of picking up a few of your phrases from the book. The fiat standard was a series of temporary measures. They were supposed to be temporary. Each measure a response to the problems inherent to the gold standard and born out of a need to default on debts. So elaborate on this. Yeah, this is basically, um, well, it, yeah, this is kind of the summation of the uh, whole of chapter two that you see starting from 1914 when England uh, went into the war all the way up until 1971. Every single progression in the, way, in the move away from gold was always uh, temporary and it was always just an emergency and you know we're going to get back to normal and everything's going to be all right and then instead it continued to get to move away um in the opposite direction away from uh, away from a gold standard into fiat and effectively it was how governments defaulted it's i think the the way to understand the fiat system is that it is uh, it, it's kind of the botched abortion of uh, the default of governments who commit to war with resources and gold that they didn't have. And so they figured the only way that we could, uh, I mean, essentially there was nobody to take all of these governments into receivership at the same time, since they were all <laughs> bankrupt. And effectively, you know, they, they, they were bankrupt to their own descendants and their own descendants weren't there to take them to court and uh, liquidate them and uh, you know bring in uh, new management and so they essentially took over the money payment system and used it uh, and, and dumped their default bags on it essentially and then from then on we've had this entire 20th century story of governments monopolizing banking and international uh, banking, so international correspondence banking, as well as savings, you have to save in the same shitty fiat token that uh, runs the uh, payment network that they use and also backs the currency that they issue. And that's really the fiat standard, that you have to use this currency that they are constantly borrowing against. You have to put all of your family and all of your wealth and all of your money and all of your capital constantly up there as collateral for your government. You have no other choice. Well, right. So so the gold when the gold standard, you have a tremendous wealth being built up. And then there's a switch over to a fiat standard. And the the ancestors who built that wealth are, are going to see their wealth destroyed, but they're not around to answer anymore. Uh the 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 children of these folks, the grandchildren destroy it all essentially with fiat money. But you make a very interesting connection between fiat money and war. So 1914, of course, uh went off the gold standard, and we went into World War I. In 1971, America couldn't afford the Vietnam War anymore, so we closed the gold window and issued a lot of fiat money under Nixon. Uh, Paul Krugman over the New York Times, Nobel-winning economist at the New York Times, says in his uh, column that the U.S. dollar is backed with men by guns. So there's this direct correlation between fiat money and violence and uh, would kind of make us believe that gold is a certain limiting uh, property on a war, because if you run out of gold, you have to stop the war. And that was the way it was and has been throughout history. And the invention of fiat money allowed war to continue past its uh, financial point of no return. But then with Bitcoin now, it's not only hard money like war, so uh, gold that limits war, but it actually transfers uh, sovereignty away 
from the centralized authorities that might even start a war. So that's a very interesting moment in the history of peace, safety. It absolutely is. It's insane. It really is insane when you think about just what a neat technological engineering solution it is to the problem of endless war. Because the century of fiat was the century of war, and it's not a coincidence. If you look at wars under the gold standard, you know, um, generals were very careful about not uh, wasting soldiers needlessly, and kings were very careful about that too, because they knew that if they ran out of gold, that's it, they're out of gold, and then anybody can attack them, and they won't be able to pay soldiers, and then they're gone. And so you have to be careful about it. But with the fiat standard, there's just always an extra layer where instead of just uh, these corrupt leaders or bad leaders, instead of them just defaulting in by uh, running out of gold, it's like you give them another 10, 20, 30 year lease of life by allowing them to be parasites on the entire accumulated capital of society because everybody's capital is stored in a bank account because you can't just hold gold um, you know, under your uh, mattress because that's not very saleable across space. You can't send it. You can't use it for payments day to day. So you have to put more, most of your money in the financial system. And then if it's in the financial system, well, then it allows a defaulted government to continue to borrow um, based on the premise that it can still devalue the currency. And essentially, it can finance itself from uh, the savings of its uh, citizens. And so, of course, the end result is the same. You know, if they get to, if they if they ran out of their own money, they are also going to run out of your money. <laughs> There's no question about it. So you're only denying the inevitable uh, by a decade or two or a century or two, I think. But uh um, and and you're causing so much more uh, economic damage because you know in 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 an orderly world in which fiat wouldn't be the monetary system and in which they had to use gold or Bitcoin or some form of hard money that governments all of them cannot print. You know, as soon as a government gets into the point where it's not being very profitable, it becomes more profitable for people to overthrow it and it gets overthrown. You know, you can imagine it being far less messy of a process um, than the endless wars that we see uh, simmer in the 20th century because there's always an infinite amount of financing ready for whoever takes over the government. And so when, when the economy goes bad, everybody wants to be in charge of the government and everybody's fighting about it and it becomes a matter of life and death and it can be financed by it. So. The, the, the neat solution here is that Bitcoin allows us to have wealth that is saleable across time, meaning that you can save the value in it for the future, but also saleable across space. So just because, uh, uh, you know, it's like gold in that it's saleable across time and even better than gold uh, because it has NGU technology, um, number go up technology, but also it's saleable across space, even better than fiat because you can send it across international borders and it would achieve you know final settlement depending on how many transactions you uh, how many confirmations you want to wait for but you know one hour or 10 hours or whatever it is much faster than having to run through central banks and you know um going through governments and legal and judicial systems so it's uh it 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 allows just so much wealth to not be uh, pillaged by warlords around the world that uh, if you like not seeing people get killed all over the world, you probably would appreciate, I think. <laughs> right. You mentioned that when we first went off the gold standard, when these nations went broke because of World War One, it was like they, they they went they were in debt to future generations. And of course, Paul Krugman also said that debt is just money we owe to ourselves. And so we could write infinite amounts of debt. He also said, as Max pointed out, that that fiat, he says, is better than Bitcoin because Bitcoin is not backed by men with guns. So he believes that having your currency backed by men with guns is a good thing. Now, if if when I look at it, when I think of what he said about that, what Bitcoin is backed by is men and women with nodes, ASICs, and private keys. Like, there's no violence in there. So... Yeah, that's 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 very true, yeah. And the, and the actual genesis, as you lay out in your course of the fiat standard, 
is that, you know, those three pivotal moments really in the fiat standard, uh, August of, of 1915, when the Bank of England, the United Kingdom seized its citizens gold, essentially it confiscated it through um, propaganda, perhaps maybe not as violently as what the U.S. did with Executive Order 6102. But, you know, the, it was always it, the actual birth of it was an act of violence. Nevertheless, you're kind of sympathetic or have a, a little bit of empathy by your standards anyway, for these uh, the fiat money pushers. Like, what if they didn't invent, what if they didn't seize the citizens' gold? Like, what would have happened? Where would we be today? I don't know what, uh, I don't really know World War One enough to know what would have happened. But I think, you know, ultimately all uh, World War One combatants um, took the money of their uh, people and used it to fight the war. And so you could argue that it cancels it cancels each other out, and you could argue that it, um, um, you know the other aspect of it is that the country that came out ahead of World War One, the country that was to become the world leader after World War One, was the U.S., and that was because it was the one that went off the gold standard the latest. It was only in 1917 that the U.S. went off the gold standard. So initially in 1914, when the Fed was established, it was still on the gold standard. And then in 1917, when it went into the war, that's when uh, de facto it suspended the gold standard. But it would return to the gold standard in, um, I mentioned it in the book, I think it was 22 or 23. They would get back on the gold standard. So in some sense, I think the the, the short-termist view of this is, well, you devalue your people's citizenship uh, your citizens' money, and then you win the war. Ah, you know, the Keynesian genius, bloodthirsty idiots uh, exclaim with joy. But in reality, uh, it, it really ends up being that the countries that end up winning the war are the ones that maintain their currencies over the long run much better because their money is better, their money is more trustworthy. And in fact, that ends up meaning that in times of war and conflict, they would be likely to attract capital. So a big part of the problem with fiat was that a lot of the money in Europe moved to the US because Europeans were busy fighting with each other and people feared that it would get devalued. And that was really what was driving much of the gold shortage in Europe because at the time they were printing, people started to take their gold to the US. So um, it's it's hard to disentangle, you know, how when you would draw the line if you wanted to run a counterfactual to it. But if we say that, um, arguably, I would say, my guess would be, if you had some kind of uh, technological solution that made going off the gold standard impossible back in 1914, uh, probably, you know, the the conflict would have been resolved between Serbia and Austria. Maybe Germany would have entered. Maybe a couple of others. And even if it had been all of the great powers entering it, I think it would have been settled much earlier. Now, who would have won what ultimately doesn't even matter. You know, if you look at the map of the world before and after World War I and World War II, it's, it, it's not that pressing. Like Austrians continued to live in Austria and Germans continued to live in Germany. And um, there wasn't that much territorial change. It was just that they could continue to fight with each other. So I think, you know, Maybe it would have been a short war. Maybe it would have ended very quickly. And then we would have gone back on a gold standard. And what's amazing is to think if we had continued with the kind of economic system before 1914, continued with it, and then with the technologies that were invented before 1914, which, you know, that technology re did come to age in the, 20th in the 20th century, but it came to age at a time when we were using this um, uh, kind of semi-barter monetary system of fiat, which uh, loses value and has inflation, has all these problems. I think, you know, we'd be maybe 50 years ahead, maybe 100 years ahead, uh, technologically speaking, if we had uh, gold over the last 20th century. Yeah, you know, thinking about this uh, 1914 period, of course, it came not too lo long after the Industrial Revolution. And uh, that required the invention of the industrial production of fiat money, almost, you could say to feed the capital markets, which were burgeoning at that time, and globalization was happening. And um, these two things reinforced each other, and you had the social contract that had come along about 100 years earlier challenged because suddenly the state was uh, able to amass capital through their defense expenditures and 
You know, we talk about in the U.S. the in, the military industrial complex and and how the the industrialization of the military have have become this albatross, uh, the the deep state as it's known in the U.S. And so the social contract, which was talked about back in the 1700s by John Locke, you know, this delicate balance between the governed and the government. And how do you manage that? It got completely lopsided. And and people began to understand this in the 60s and 70s, in particular in America, because we felt like our our rights were being challenged. And we had a lot of civil rights movements. But my question is that with Bitcoin, the even the whole industrial model is shifting to the individual with the help of 3D printing, online access to anything you need, the cottage industries, uh, cottage content producers, music producers, uh, P2P file swapping, like the industrial revolution has now been overturned by the sovereign individual. Money has been separated from the state. Um, and so the social contract has, has really is undergoing a revolution here that in, in a way that has, we haven't seen in 300 years uh, with Bitcoin at the, at, at enabling this whole thing. And, the big losers are going to be the state and the central banks. Uh, what are we? What are we going to look for in twenty twenty one? Are they just going to roll over and and uh, basically give up, or are they going to try to cling to power even though it's impossible? Safety. I think um, no. I think you know the, the, there's still a lot of um, trump cards they can play. Um, it's it's easy to underestimate uh, the fiat monster, but it's not impossible for it to continue to uh, carry on for another five, ten, maybe fifty years. Who knows? I think the next stage now. Um, so now you you look at it. You know, basically the the vast majority of governments around the world are um, in a very precarious fiscal position, particularly by the end of twenty twenty. Everybody's got uh, terrible budget deficits and growing debt, and um, you know the same toxic cocktail is uh, brewing all over the world. However, um, again, what I think they could do right now is we can have a new Bretton Woods moment, and you already see the international organizations uh, mention this, and I think there's still scope for some new Treaty of Genoa slash Bretton Woods where they all get together. And if you look at the kind of um, world order today, it does seem quite amicable in general. Um, there's, uh, you know, coronavirus happens, everybody goes along and wears the same masks and stays at home. And so uh, if you believe in international harmony and cooperation, I guess this, uh, th this kind of pretends well. And I think there's some room to, to strike a bargain now with uh, China essentially being the only, or having essentially the only healthy, semi-healthy balance sheet left by the end of 2020, and because it has a lot of savings. Potentially, I think what we could see is a creation of a new central bank digital currency, SDR kind of thing. So a new, um, maybe a digital SDR, um, something like that, which is used as central bank reserve currency and uh, administered by the IMF or something like that, or the World Bank or whatever. And I think, you know, there, there's scope for essentially introducing this as a kind of uh, uh, a solution wherein the share of global reserves that accrues to China increases. I think this is really where the bargain can be striked. So currently the U.S. has uh, about 50% of global uh, reserve, 51%. The euro is about 17, gold is about 15 and then various other insignificant fiat uh, coins are uh, under 5%. So I think, you know, the, the yuan is currently at only 1.7. So there's scope for increasing the size of the yuan in the global reserve currency pool by introducing a new currency that is part yuan, part, uh, uh, U, part US dollar, part euro, maybe even part gold, who knows. Um, but I think there's something to be done around that for a while. Um, you know, because Bitcoin needs time to eat the world. So I think that they can still pull something like this off. And of course, you know, it would be quite convenient for Bitcoin because it would, you know, 
uh, it would be the best advertisement for Bitcoin. Because look, here's a shitcoin that has very high inflation and is controlled by all the world's governments together. And nobody knows how much of it exists and nobody knows if you can keep it and they can take it at any point in time. Or you can have Bitcoin with its unique and proprietary number go up technology. And it's, uh, you know, complete uh, uh, decentralized nature where nobody controls it. Well, I want to pick up on that decentralization of the Bitcoin network, because let's look at how you teach this course on the fiat standard is for Bitcoiners. You explain the fiat standard using a lot of the terms from the Bitcoin world. So you have the Fed as the node operator, essentially. They're the equivalent of the nodes. Lending is like the miner. But, you know, there's in, in it really stands out to me reading uh, the, the chapters so far available on fiat standard is not only ha- that the fiat standard was born out of violence and default, but that it really centralized the system. Because, you know, in the gold center, there were a lot of goldsmiths. There were all sorts of wealthy people with lots of gold. And kings would often have to go to the wealthy citizens and ask them for gold and convince them. They had to sell them on the war, why this war was a good idea. Give them more gold. Now, no no permission is needed at all, right? They could just print at will and issue credit at will. So go over this, the the central bank, because if we're going to have the central bank currencies, the central bank as the node operator. Yeah, I think um, if you want to think about it in terms of Bitcoin, you know, we have several kinds of nodes in the fiat system. It's not a peer-to-peer system where we only have uh, one kind of node and they're all peers equal, with equal rights and obligations in the network and privileges. No, we only have one full node effectively, which is the Federal Reserve. And effectively, the Federal Reserve, you know, it can create uh, money at will and it can confiscate or give uh, money at will. So. It's like the it's it's like having one full node on the Bitcoin network and then having all the other nodes just copy its uh, blockchain. So imagine if you had the one Bitcoin full node and you could do anything with it and you could you, you could just decide you take my coins or you could just decide I'm not part of the network anymore that my coins don't work on the network. You could you know revoke my private keys effectively. Uh, this is kind of how fiat works um, in, in terms of a network, but. Um, it, 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 you're absolutely correct in that it is centralizing and effectively it makes economic value. And this is the focus of the second part of the book, which I haven't uh, published yet. Um, it's coming in the few, next few weeks. It changes uh, the whole conception of economic value in society from being about producing things that get people to pay you money because it's hard, honest money versus um versus uh, value as being something that is essentially decided by government fiat. You know, government says this is uh, X, therefore this is X. You know, government could point at a bunch of industrial waste like soy uh, sludge and call this food and then it becomes food. And then you have entire nutrition departments that convince people that, you know, you should eat this. And you have an entire industry that springs around that uh, tries to make this edible for people and they push it with all kinds of ways because you know, they decreed that this is food and um, it, it it completely overpowers the process of the free market. And I think it's, um, it's you hear Bitcoiners say this, but it's, it, it, to an extent, it is, it, it's very true that you just can't have a free market if you have fiat money, because um, the whole point about fiat market, if, the whole reason which you can have, um, the only way that you can have fi- a, a free market exist is in when individuals on the market own capital and are able to make economic calculation with their capital. But if economic calculation is essentially conducted in Stephanie Kelton's funny scoreboard, where you know it's 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 like um, that Drew Carey show, what, what do they call it, where the points don't matter. Uh, the lines are made up and the points don't matter. Uh, oh, I haven't seen that. Whose line is it anyway? I haven't seen Drew. Whose Perry. line is it anyway? <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, whose line is it anyway? That's essentially what an economy is, what a fiat economy is. Everything is just made up on the spot and government can intervene. So um, in the second part of the book, I discuss many of those aspects of life and how much it um, it, it, it is distorting in, in, in a quite harmful way. And um, yeah, and, and I think interestingly, and you can, in gold, you don't find this kind of centralization because when it was gold coin, 
people from all over the world could make gold coins and they could sell them everywhere because anybody could test it and verify it with uh, several ways. And, 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 and there were the, for instance, the, the, the Byzantine solidus, which later became the Islamic dinar. You know, these kind of coins existed for many thousands of years with similar weight and similar value and were well known and people have, um, you know, ha have uh, religious scripture written in terms of these units of account that have held up for hundreds and thousands of years. And um, it, 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 anybody could make this coin and anybody could accept it and anybody could verify it. It was far more decentralized, but with a fiat system, it was really bringing, as you said, the industrial efficiency of um, industrialization to the process of money in a way that was quite suffocating of the uh, free market process um, and, and, and suffocating of its growth, I think. Right, right. The industrialization, and now we had the development of the, quote, external costs. So the, uh, the environmental considerations were not factored into the costs. And uh, that crowded out a lot of the civil society's open space and the public domain and things like that. But I want to talk a little bit about hard money itself and the idea of money because it gives people hope. You know, why would anyone save money unless they hoped for a better tomorrow? Uh, why do people save money at all? Because they th they're thinking about the next day. Pe entrepreneurs are thinking about a business in the future. Uh, parents are thinking about their kids' education. Um, you know, they're thinking in the future, as you point out in the Bitcoin standard, it's the high time preference versus low time preference. And I've said about the Bitcoin standard, it's really three books. It's a book about the history of money. It's a book about Bitcoin. And it's a book about high time preference versus low time preference as a philosophical conceit, which is, I think, extremely important to consider. So with gold, as we're saying in this discussion, it has high time preference value. You can save it and it, you can spend it in the future and that's hopeful but it also can be confiscated and it also can be overly concentrated by the state and it also can be market abused with derivatives as we know as going on but with bitcoin you remove all that and you have nothing but pure hope you can take it with you into the future it can't be confiscated it's deflationary so what's left and i'm just more of a philosophical question if you blow away all the doubt and fear and you're left with only hope isn't that kind of a major transition for humanity, as even Paul Tudor Jones has said? He thinks Bitcoin is pro-humanity. Are we getting into something here that makes some monetary historical sense, or is this pure philosophical uh, conjecture? What do you think, Safetyn? No, I think so. I, I entirely agree with you. I think if you look at, um, there's an interesting study called uh, History of Interest Rates by uh, Homer and uh, Scylla. And it, it goes through 5,000 years of human history and looks at data on interest rates across the world from uh, all over the world. And you see, there was always a distinct negative trend in the long term with interest rates. Interest rates have constantly been going down. And that makes sense uh, from an Austrian economics perspective, because as humanity continues to accumulate more capital, as we develop technologically, as we advance our standard of living, we're able to afford more capital and we're able to make capital more available for entrepreneurs. In other words, we're able to make interest rates lower and lower. And it's interesting because uh, by 1914, you know, by the early 20th century, interest rates had gotten to the point where they were at around 2% in England. And I've wondered, you know, what, and then of course, what happened was with the move toward fiat money, we, you see that interest rates started rising back in 1914 and continued to rise all the way up until the 1970s and 80s, at which point they started dropping again. And now they're back at zero, roughly. But, um, you know, since 1914, obviously, interest rates have increased, but also interest, interest rates have become massively distorted because they're no longer uh, real interest rates in a sense of being provided on the market. They are determined by central banks largely, and they are objects of policy and they can be manipulated by, you know, essentially manipulating the yield curve. And um, it, it stops being as accurate of a signal, but I've always wondered what would have happened if, you know, as we were saying earlier, what would have happened if we didn't have a world war that went on for so long? And if we didn't have fiat money, if we didn't have all of that? And, you know, if the war just was some uh, conflict that lasted six months or three months in Central Europe, and then life went on afterward. 
uh, if this was the case, you know, would have been interesting to see how this kind of monetary system would have developed. And I think I would posit to say that I, I would imagine that with um, a few more decades under the gold standard, or as we would see in, an, in a Bitcoin-based economy, eventually you would get a 0% interest rate. I think we would get to a point where interest rates decline so much, time preference drops so much. Because in, from the Austrian perspective, I should add, should have mentioned that you know interest rates are a reflection of time preference. And so as we accumulate more capital, time preference drops. And uh, with that, interest rates drop. I think there is a, you know, in, um, time preference will never be zero, but it can drop to being uh, close enough to zero that it is effectively, uh, it, 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 it becomes effectively zero on the market. Um, and essentially, I think what we would see is that in, in, in that kind of world, people would uh, only have two kinds of financial products, which is essentially deposit banking and equity investment. I can't see the case for um, interest rate, fixed interest rate lending when you don't have anybody with a printer and you don't have anybody who controls the payment rails who can effectively do some hocus pocus that uh, works like a printer because you can't guarantee anybody any particular returns and you can't guarantee protection from loss. And so um, I, I imagine that the only kind of investment that would exist in that kind of place would be effectively equity investment. Or you would give people money to put it on deposit, and then you would pay them to keep it available for you. Or they would give it to people who take risk with it, and then you know you bear the risk on the downside or on the upside. I think a majority of people just need to put their money in saving, and a majority of money needs to be in saving. And if you look at um, financial markets today, if you ask anybody, uh, would you substitute whatever you have? How much of your how much of your portfolio would you substitute for? a financial asset that appreciates at 1% or 2% every year, let's say. And I think you would get somewhere around 50% of all financial assets, maybe maybe 40, maybe 60, maybe 70. But somewhere in that range, you know, most people would be happy to take 1% or 2% in real terms every year, uh, reliably over the long run on a very big chunk of their uh, portfolio. So I think you'd have a big chunk of that in saving where people just keep the money in saving. And that's it. It's all locked up in private keys and it's stored for the future. And um, I, I think you know, this is this would be quite uh, quite a big thing, as right. you say. And so, is is missing from your historical analysis really the school of thought of monetarism? You know, we saw with Milton Friedman in the '80s and the deregulatory environment of Thatcher and Reagan. It, when you when you're talking about interest rates, there, it, it, I'm thinking about when I was a stockbroker in the '80s. You know, we were all into monetarism and we tracked the money supply figures very closely every month. And it was not Keynesianism. It was it was this new school of where interest rates and, and, and manipulating the interest rate uh, curve was how the economy was managed. But uh, what I'm getting from what you're saying here is that it's ultimately as bogus as trying to just say that debt is only something we owe ourselves. In other words, it didn't really... Um, carry us into uh, a, a, a nirvana economically because we had these enormous crashes in, in the market due to the over-financialization and the worshiping of interest rates. So, I mean, didn't interest rates at, yeah. for about 20 years there become the mantra that was going to guide us to perpetual um, you know, prosperity, but that too uh, kind of crashed on the rocks and, and didn't work. That's my first question. My second question is, with Austrian economics, up until Bitcoin, it was always a theory. But with Bitcoin, it's actually a practice. Is that true? Is that a true statement? It seems that it could, until you separate the state from money, you could never actually try to do Austrian economics. It was something that was just a theoretical uh, school, but now it's actually happening. Uh, so your comments on those two points. So on uh, interest rates, in, in, in a world of uh, hard money, if you have low interest rates, that means you have very large amounts of savings. In a world of uh, government fiat money, if you have low interest rates, that means you have somebody in a position somewhere who decided you have interest rates. It tells you nothing about the amount of savings that you have in real terms. So uh, as such, 
you know, we, we've seen interest rates drop under the fiat system, but the way in which they drop is not because of the increased availability of capital, it's because essentially you're borrowing at the expense of the future, and that borrowing is manifesting through inflation that uh, appears in the long run in, um, in, uh, for all uh, currency holders and, you know, happens in all assets, uh, particularly scarce assets. Um, so yeah, so so the, the monetarist uh, dream is um, unfortunately, you know, the, the 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 monitors don't apply the critical lens which they would usually apply to regular uh, thinking about um, uh, market interventions and government policies. They just don't apply that to money in their perspective. In terms of money, it's uh, you know, money needs to be centrally planned. The government needs to be out there and making sure that the money goes by this rule or that rule. Right, or- that was my point. They were just they 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 saw things as central planning as central planning as the Keynesians, but they did so through interest rates. That was my point. Uh, and then yeah, with- and they justify it by trying to pretend that you know, well, at least we're not Keynesians and we're pretend- yeah. and we're preventing uh, the Keynesians. And to be fair, um, let's be fair, like you know. Given the choice, if you were going to pick a place over the last 100 years, you know, you were going to be born in a place, would you rather live in a place that's going to have 50 years of um, Keynesians in charge of monetary policy, or would you rather have the Chicago monetarists in charge of your monetary policy? I would still go with the Chicago monetarists. Uh, You'll still get inflation. It won't be ideal, but it's much better than the Keynesians. And what was the second? Yeah, point then the, as far as Austrian school, it seems like we we can actually have an Austrian economics. So for the audience who might not, I mean, can you summarize Austrian economics in a couple of sentences and then say, yeah, what Bitcoin makes it possible, or is that not that possible? Or what do you think? Can you, is it possible to s- summarize it? Basically, Austrian economics is what economics would be like without the silly hocus pocus of the Keynesians, which is essentially just a bunch of confusion that um, uh, wastes people's time at university where they receive a whole bunch of uh, nonsense and try and make sense of it and fail and think, oh, well, economics must be really difficult. Well, economics is not really difficult. It's just that uh, economics at universities is largely um Keynesian nonsense. So the Austrian school uh, differs primarily from the mainstream schools in that it conceives of value as being subjective. And so immediately off the bat, you understand that value exists only in people's consciousness and that everything in economics needs to be understood. All value in economics needs to be understood as subjective. Which right. Immediately- so, sorry to cut in, but isn't it then possible to say one of the benefits of Bitcoin is that it has no utility? other than to be pure money. Because in other words, like silver, they say, oh, it's closer to money because it has utility. But that's actually a drawback for silver because then you've got price discovery based on its industrial use. Same thing for gold. Gold's got, quote, value in electronics, et cetera, but that's not pure subjective valuing. Then you have a market for it. Bitcoin, it only has one purpose, and that is to be a pure savings mechanism. And therefore, it's purely subjective, and therefore, it's Austrian economics. Uh, well, the value of gold and silver uh, in jewelry and uh, electricity is also subjective. All value is subjective. So uh, the, the, there isn't a distinction in terms of uh, all, all of it is subjective value. Um, I, I think there is um, – there is. Uh, the, the conception of value as being uh, objective or subjective is not really um, – essential to uh, to Bitcoin. It's I, 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 What I object to and how you've specified this is, is it's as if Bitcoin is a test of this. And I don't think that is the case. And I don't think that Austrian economics was kind of um, you know useless before Bitcoin. Uh, Austrian economics is just a way of understanding economics. It's, it's a method of thinking about economics, which is um, the summation of many hundreds of years and many uh, uh, traditions and many scholars from all over the world um, leading each other and coming up with different perspectives. Um, this is essentially uh, just a way of approaching and thinking systematically about questions. It's not so much a, um, it's not so much a testable hypothesis about economics. Um, and so, in in this regard, I think what is really interesting about money, in particular, about Bitcoin in particular, is that it is a test of the proposition in Austrian economics that um, Mises and Rothbard make, which is that the quantity of money itself does not matter. Money is not a good that is acquired for its quantity, and any quantity of money is enough. Um, And Bitcoin is a living uh, 
in embodiment of this. So that's what's really very interesting about it. Because according to all other um, schools of economics, there is some kind of superstitious reason, and they have some kind of superstitious math where they want to explain to you uh, why this necessitates that we need to make more money. <laughs> there's always a story and there's always a bunch of math. And the answer is we need to make more money. So I have a follow-up to this because you were mentioning subjective value and things like that. I want to talk about an objective reality that we could all see. The United States is the empire of fiat currency, of the fiat standard. And one could see, everybody could see, that two-thirds of the population is overweight. Uh, some, cl- about 40% are obese, 20% are morbidly obese. It just seems like if this is the image of a fiat empire versus, say, the Roman Empire and all that they left behind, or Florence and the amazing art that they were able to create and inventions and, and discoveries made during a time of the Florin. Like that there's something that's obviously not that just visually you would say, I don't want that system, whatever causes that. Um, yeah, I think there's there's something there because the, the, the fiat system is uh, like the late period of the Roman Empire where they were already getting into inflation and, um, you know, it was bread and circus and uh, things weren't very good. Um, but uh, with harder money, you see that uh, people have much more of an incentive to think about the long run. I think this is really the difference. Um, ultimately, if you're able to have security in financially in that you know that you can expect that your savings can appreciate over time, I think if everybody is able to have this, I think uh, we were saying this earlier, if you know if you went to people and told them you'll have you can replace a part of your portfolio with something that yields um, regularly one or two percent, reliably and you know it's it's a rock it's always going to have its value nobody can make uh nobody can print it for free it, it, most people would exchange that for this because the amount of security that provides you that you know you worked today you're able to make a lot of money today and you're able to store that money away and you know that you will always have it 10 20 years down the line you'll always have this this is really uh, something that I think changes the uh, entire um, psyche of a human being. It's it's quite amazing, and I think you know you see it uh, with Bitcoiners on uh, Twitter um, and when in in Bitcoin conferences, everybody has stories about just how Bitcoin makes this change in you individually because you've suddenly uh, and 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 Mises is, uh, can help us understand this but Mises says you know the only reason people acquire money is because of uncertainty of the future if there was no uncertainty about the future if you knew the future with complete certainty you wouldn't need to hold any money you would make it so that you would sell all of your investments exactly at the moment that you need to make the spending that you need to make and so you wouldn't have to hold the money so you effectively you know you liquidate your stocks and uh, make the payment directly to your uh, to, to the person you're buying it from. If you had everything planned and and there was no uncertainty about the future, there would be no reason to hold money. But there is uncertainty about the future, and there's enormous uncertainty about the future. And money helps us um, alleviate that uncertainty. The more money we are able to secure for the future, and the more we have trust in the ability of this money to be there in the future, the more we are able to. Uh, the, the less uncertainty we have about the future and the more certainty we have in the future. And therefore, the more we are likely to provide for the future, the more likely we are to think of the world in terms of, you know, next year, next 10 years, next 20 years, next 50 years, what's the world going to be like? And um, effectively, you know, human civilization is the process of lowering our time preference, lengthening our time horizon, accumulating more capital. And I think, um, uh, you know, you could add to those things also, it's the process of hardening our money. We're constantly putting, uh, we're constantly putting all kinds of things into use as money, and through thousands of years of natural market competition, they are getting weeded out. The, the bad things are not getting used as money, and the better things are getting used. So nobody uses copper anymore as money. Nobody except you guys uses silver as money anymore. <laughs> but everybody else is over it. Uh, soon enough, you know, there won't be anybody using uh, gold anymore, maybe, potentially. Um, but, you know, the process of moving from copper to silver to gold was the process of moving toward harder and harder money. 
and uh, by the early 20th century, um, by the end of the 19th century, everybody was already on the um, gold standard and everybody had moved to gold as the hardest money. And so that means that people had harder money. So people had better savings technology. We've always been trying to save and we're always trying to use everything we find as a saving technology. And through the brutal competition of markets and through learning from one another and through copying one another, we'd arrived as, at gold as the best solution by the early 20th century. And now we've, as, uh, as I think you would agree, we've 100x or 1000x the gold solution in terms of money by introducing Bitcoin. It's just a much, much harder and better money. And I think it's, it's, it's an inevitable technological leap forward. You had said in your book, The Fiat Standard, that at its essence, the fiat standard destroys savings and planning for the future in order to operate a payments network, which is interesting because that can relate to what happened in 2017 and the Bitcoin, uh, you know, hard fork. Absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. I think it's it, it, effectively what, it, what the fiat system does is, you know, because the government has a monopoly on the payment system, they can abuse the currency uh, and they can borrow against the currency and they can uh, issue bonds that are denominated in the currency and effectively put people's savings um, at risk to finance their spending. And that's what's uh, financed so much uh, bad spending throughout the 20th century. And effectively, people seem to be under the illusion that this is the only way that you can run a payment system. You know, we're not able to have international payments unless we have a central bank that manages an international cash account with foreign currencies and also uses that to back the deposits in the bank and also uses that uh, to, to back the currency. No, these things can't be provided individually on the market. You know, you can have banks that trade and you can have saving banks and they can be the same accounts, but your money for savings doesn't have to be related to international trade. Uh, people who trade can put their own capital into trade and you can choose to be part of a bank that doesn't engage in foreign trade if you wanted to and doesn't have foreign currency exchange risk. Um, if we had a free market, you know, we'd have all of these things being provided on the market and there wouldn't be a problem with it. It's, it's the fact that it is a monopoly that continuously makes it fail. And um, really, it, it's why Bitcoin is really the only answer, because other than this, there, there's no way to run this monopoly correctly. Like it's it's where you see in the book, as you mentioned, there's a little bit of sympathy to the fiat system in that. Like you can sort of see how the motivation comes along. Like we just abuse the currency for a little bit. We can win the war against those evil foreigners. And you can understand how most people would sympathize with this. You don't need to muster an evil conspiracy to have this. And then you can see how when you're they're trying to manage this thing in a democratic system, how it's just going to be an endless uh, uh, series of, you know, kicking the can down the road, one person after the other, trying their best to kick the can down the road. But the, even if those people were well-meaning and even if they were trying their best to do it well, there's just no way you can centrally plan a currency and centrally plan the value of the currency and centrally plan trade and centrally plan all of those things at the same time. There's, there's no way you can uh, successfully substitute for a uh, free market in those things. And you know, th there's no way that they can reform it, I think. Um, well, maybe there is, but I, I don't see the possibility for reform as being very strong. That's why I think really Bitcoin is the only alternative. So, uh, Safetine, as an educator, as a professor, as a writer in the education system, uh, currently uh, mired in debt, people graduating with hundreds of thousands of dollars in debt, of fiat money debt, you're... Uh, education, your fiat standard, which I guess people can sign up for, and they're getting the chapters delivered to them sequentially over time. It's the opposite because everyone I know that started wanted to get educated about Bitcoin for the last 10 years has got stinking rich. It's like the opposite of the regular <laughs> education system that puts you into debt. When you go into a Bitcoin education system, you get rich. I mean, that's the difference between the Safe Dean University and Harvard. Harvard will put you into debt and you end up being like Larry Summers, a, a <laughs> poser for the establishment who makes garbage up for the Financial Times. You go to the Fiat Standard yep. course and you get your intellect massaged and expanded. At the same time, you, you got the number go up technology. You must be the most popular professor in the world, Safe Dean. 
And the, you only pay $15 a month. Like you go to Harvard, you're only watching Zoom calls anyway. Yeah. And you're paying 70, whatever it is, thousand fiat coins a month, uh, a year um, on it. And, you know, at, at, at safedean.com, you pay 100 bucks a month and that's it. Uh, 100 bucks a year or 15 bucks a month. And that's it. And you get the chapters and you get to read them as they're being written. And you get to discuss them on the forum and you get to join uh, the seminars. I think, uh, you know, education is... Um, and, and communication it can be done so very cheaply. And over the last 50 years, as telecommunications has gotten cheaper, it could have been done so much, much cheaper than it has been done. But universities have absolutely no incentive for that because they are fiat. They are part of the fiat system. They survive, they live and die by fiat money. They get their money from government, not from the consumers. Uh, of course, they do charge extortionate fees, most of them, to students, but that's still not where they get their main money. Their main money comes from uh, playing the fiat uh, political system and getting loans uh, and, and getting research grants. And All right, uh, when I went to New York University, it was a real estate holding company. They're building dorm rooms where they squish hundreds of students into dorms at a much higher density than they could on a residential uh, development. And uh, that was basically NYU's game plan. It's a property development firm disguised as an education facility, and here you are, basically for fifteen dollars a month, people are getting uh, one of the best educations. And not even Plato and Aristotle knew about Bitcoin. You're going to be smarter than those guys. I mean, I mean, you're going to be the smartest people in three thousand years. But let me ask you this: so, as you obviously you're continuing to write about this, and so it's a bit of an intellectual journey that you are on, safety and a moose. Where are you really? thinking about in terms of, pl of of applying your research here at this moment into this phenomenon because it is a growing phenomenon we haven't the final chapters have not been written on this what's the bleeding edge right now uh what's 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 where are you looking at it and just thinking like wow i got to dig deeper into this part of it because this seems to be where the next wave of of transformation is coming from I think the really interesting thing is um, to imagine Bitcoin. This is uh, this is a meme that I've been trying to propagate for the last couple of years, which is to imagine the kind of peaceful takeover of Bitcoin. Like uh, Bitcoin is just a simple monetary uh, software upgrade where maybe the fiat system doesn't have to collapse and we don't have to continue to have, uh, we don't have to have a global Venezuela. We can all upgrade to Bitcoin effectively before uh, um, the fiat system collapses. And I think maybe th there's been a lot of uh, doomsday uh, uh, speculation around Bitcoin from day one, you know, that Bitcoin is going to rise because of hyperinflation and so on. And, uh, and, and that's influenced by the fact that a lot of the people that are into Bitcoin are into Bitcoin because they're worried about hyperinflation. But it might be that uh, Bitcoin is the market solution for the problem of hyperinflation. It's the technological solution for this problem, like the market and the technology and um, Satoshi and the cryptography uh, um, uh, scholars over the year and all those people have managed to develop an intellect uh, and, and, and a technological achievement that can be utilized by anybody who's suffering from the fiat standard and its problems in a way that can uh, make the move away from fiat standard not painful. Um, we're just going to, you know, as uh, we're going to witness more and more people migrate toward the fiat, toward the Bitcoin system. And every person who migrates will get to benefit from Bitcoin's number go up technology because, you know, um, there's a limited number of Bitcoins. So it's not like the latecomers will, uh, will lose because there will still be um, a limited amount. And as economic value goes up, the value of the, net, the, the Bitcoins will continue to go up. So even, even, even if you think about it, even after how half the world's population has already moved to Bitcoin, there's still at least a 100% appreciation left in Bitcoin. You can still get into Bitcoin and still double your money. You still have 100% NGU left. Even after half the world's money and half the world's population, if we assume, went into Bitcoin, there's still a lot of NGU left. There's still a lot of potential for Bitcoin's price appreciation. And as we move toward a world, world in which none of all of these fiat distortions to the economy are taking place, where government is not wasting an enormous amount of people's saved capital in order to finance nutrition departments that are telling people to eat industrial waste, 
you know, where governments can't waste so much money on fighting needless wars, when you imagine all of that capital actually staying in the hands of the people who own it in the form of savings and then them being able to deploy it as capital in, uh, in, 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 in the real world, it's, it's, quite, uh, it's quite amazing to think about the potential of the task force. We can, we, we can really, I think, upgrade the economic operating system in a way that leads to a significant increase in global productivity. Uh, where it becomes normal and natural that the whole world has 5% appreciation, um, 5% productivity increase every year, maybe even 10% productivity increase every year. Right. And we this week, we have a companion piece to this interview with Safe Dean, and that's with Nick Batia. And it, they, your, two, your ideas really complement each other quite well. And what it, uh, emerges in our interview with him is that, you know, Bitcoin is a revolution in base money and layer one money. And for 5,000 years up until 2009, it's just been gold. And then all the instruments, the debt instruments and layer two and three and four sort of monies invented on top of that due to the, the, basically the problems in gold. As you said, fiat was born out of some of the inherent problems of gold. So if we remove that in order to get to the fiat standard, as you mentioned, Basically, gold had to be confiscated to eliminate that as a, an alternative to the fiat system. But Bitcoin is unconfiscatable. So it's coming in to a system, replacing a system that was born out of confiscation. So I think it's just it, it could be one of these sort of John and Yoko sort of moments where, you know, where they said war is over if you want it. So the same thing is that it's like peace is here if you want it. Like if Bitcoin's here, you can have it. Yeah, and the amazing thing is we don't have to preach peace to people because you know you don't need to rely on people's good side. You just need to appeal to their greed, and you can count on greed much more than you can count on their good side. True. It's a far more reliable human motivator, and this is the genius of Bitcoin. Like you know, come and join for the NGU technology. Number go up. It's better technology. It's better money. Um, you know, you may like war, you may like uh, economic miscalculation, you may like economic destruction, but now you have to pay for it yourself. <laughs> exactly. Now you understand, you know, the, the mere existence of Bitcoin, the, the fact that Bitcoin simply exists means that you choose to pay for those things because now you can exit it. You know, you don't like what they're doing with the dollar. You can exit the dollar. You choose to stay in the dollar. You choose to miss out on Bitcoin's number go up technology because you want to finance whatever it is that they're doing with a dollar. So uh, since Bitcoin has been invented, you know, even if you don't like Bitcoin, you're still making the choice. Before Bitcoin, you had no choice. You had to be stuck in your local monetary system. With Bitcoin, you have to make, you have to actively make the choice to, you know, you want to dedicate your saved purchasing power to, uh, <laughs> To, to, to giving, uh, to, to, to subsidizing these terrible things that governments are doing. Well, the website is safedean.com. And as you saw, he was pretty kind to us. He only laughed a little bit at my silver holdings. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Dr. Safe Dean, you know, if you're suffering from the pain of fiat money, he'll prescribe orange pills. <laughs> True. And, and uh, you'll feel a lot better. You know, that's he's my doctor. Good. I'm, I'm, yeah, you are my doctor, Max. Max and Stacy, <laughs> both of you, I, I don't say this enough. I, I cannot be thankful enough for you guys because very early on, and you made me really understand Bitcoin very, very early on. So no, yeah, you are my doctor. I noticed that we were uh, prominently not displayed in the acknowledgements in this book. I know. Bitcoin and I told standard. you, you will be in the second edition. There's a second edition coming soon. You will be in it. And I apologize for missing <laughs> I might have to edition. hit you with the money gun for I, that. I, I do. I do. There, take that. Take that. I do remember Max mentioning uh, Bitcoin to you when we first met you in uh, 2011 or 12 back then. So it was, uh, it's, well, you're our teacher now. The, the student becomes, the teacher becomes the student. Yeah, and, um, Dr. Safe Dean Amos is uh, my, the, my doctor. He's, he's also my professor. <laughs> and uh, I am enrolled in the course, the Fiat Money Standard, anxiously getting every chapter which is delivered to my inbox and uh, I get to consult with my doctor. It's tele, it's telemedicine. Tele, telemedicine. It's telemedicine. He hasn't <laughs> committed you yet. I haven't that's, been committed. <laughs> I haven't, he hasn't recommended me for a lobotomy. Right. So it's it, not like those other doctors. 
You know, <laughs> exactly. they keep telling me they strap me down. They fill me full of fiat drugs. They try to put that lobotomy in my head. I don't like that. No, I don't no, want no, no, that. no. I, I, I will only commit you to a citadel where you will eat only a lot of very delicious meat. This yeah. is the only thing I describe other than this gets stuff. better and better. All this right. This gets better and better. I love this school. I didn't learn this at NYU. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you, guys. Thank you so much for having me. All right. Bye.